So we understood that in the end, we are going to build a food system of our own. So, I mean, as, as we move forward, we're always being compared to the meat industry, but in the end, we're going to be an independent uh, food system of our own, and we're going to have our own footprint. And we, uh, we, we, from the core of this company, was how we take this and build a sustainable and resilient food system. So the way we look at sustainability, uh, we build it under four pillars of sustainability. Uh, the first is, of course, environmental. This is a, a major uh, aspect in sustainability. A lot of times it's almost, almost sometimes associated a, a almost completely only to environment, which I disagree to, but, but it is a very important aspect. Um, and we have declared that, so we call our uh, manufacturing facilities biofarms. This is how we, we call them. So our biofarms are gonna be carbon neutral by 2025. And our whole full supply chain is going to be carbon neutral by 2030. But we're not stopping on the carbon neutrality. It's, it's a very important aspect. But we want to also, we're building strategies regarding our water, uh, land use, uh, waste, uh, recyclability, circular production. I mean, so we have a very, uh, I would say, elaborated strategy regarding the environment. <laughs> Dr. Lee Recht and Didier Tubier are my guests on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Lee's main passion and dedication lies between sustainability and innovation with a personal devotion to promote resilience in the global food systems. Dr. Recht is currently head of sustainability at Aleph Farms an Israeli-based food company that paves the cultivated meat path as leader of a global sustainable food ecosystem. Working passionately to grow delicious real beef steaks from the sales of living cows. Her recent position include working with the global 1000 companies leading NGOs and high level government officials from around the world building them tailor-made ways to help identify and implement innovative solutions uh, according to the strategies and efforts that she sees fit. Lee also established and directed the Builders R&D Innovation, leading Israeli ETA hub external technology acquisition by the Coca-Cola company, and served as scientific advisor for the energy and clean tech sector at the office of the chief scientist, Ministry of Economy. Today, Israel Innovation Authority, IIA. Lee holds a PhD in biotechnology from the Ben Gurion University, uh, a BSc in food technology from the Hebrew University and an MBA specializing in strategy and international management. I went with Lee first because she is our female and wonderful, give her the honor, and Didier is the co-founder and CEO of Aleph Farms, a cultivated meat company that is shaping the future of food by growing slaughter-free beef steaks directly from cow cells. So as, as you know, Didier co-founded and led many other successful companies, IceCure, which went on to pu went public in 2010 and served as CEO of NLT Spine, which was acquired by C Spine in 2016. Didier was trained as a food engineer and biologist and holds a joint executive MBA from Kellogg and Riconti. He is also co founder of Blue Tree and Yeet. Welcome both of you. I see that you're in the headquarters there, Aleph Farms, uh, one of the conference rooms. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Hi, good morning, Mark. Glad good, to morning. Be with you. good morning. It's so good to see you both. And um, just for our listeners, we, we definitely know each other and uh, have known each other for a little while. We, um, Didier and I first met at Anuga iFood in um, 
In Cologne? Is it, wasn't it in the, the Cologne Anuga Messe? Uh, we were both uh, speaking at uh, uh, iFood and, and saw each other there and met first in person. And then Lee and Didier and I met uh, last year uh, at the COP25 in Madrid, which was a, cr a crazy climate conference for the United Nations. It was, you know, first supposed to be in Santiago, Chile, and then at then it uh, um, ended up in, in uh, Madrid and was a disaster, but it was nice because it wasn't a disaster for us because we had some good conversations and, and uh, really talked about how we can move forward on food and sustainability. So now that the listeners know how we met, I um, want them also to kind of know how both of you have weathered this crazy pandemic time um, up until now, since since we last saw each other. What's been going on? How have you been? Um, yeah, actually, the, this time is uh, definitely challenging, I believe, for everyone in the world. Although, um, yeah, at other farms have been uh, so far, you know, in the Good situation with uh, no employees being uh, contaminated or, or no um, and no one being uh, sick and from COVID-19. Everyone is healthy and we've been able to continue and um, push our r and goals through the entire period or through not always at full capacity. We're um, implementing very strict uh, restrictions in terms of uh, um, keeping uh, our employees healthy and wearing uh, um, you know, masks, uh, social distance, uh, temperature checks. And um, so it's uh, challenging in terms of the, you know, operational aspect of uh, continuing and, uh, and working and making sure we stick to the goals and to the vision. Uh, but overall, um, no, no complaints. That's great to hear. I, I expected nothing different. So not only in your past companies, but in the way you've structured and set up uh, Aleph Farms, but maybe also and, and your your personal lives in, in Israel that uh, in some respects maybe you you guys had a little bit of resilience or preparedness that you 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 had some some measures in place in your business plan to not be too reactionary but to be kind of pro proactive and preventative in in your business operations and measurements or. Or is that not the case? I mean, can you kind of maybe give us some more insight on, on was it a transition? Was it difficult? Or did you already have th some, some resilience or things in place that helped you guys, uh, still helping you guys through this time a little bit better? Yeah, I believe that um, one of the, the good things of being in Israel, which is a country where there are some emergency situations from time to time, is that overall the, the people are very reactive and flexible and can react very really quickly to an evolving situation. And we've seen that uh, not only here internally at Alephans, but also as, as a country. And uh, the, the healthcare system was able to adapt uh, very quickly when we had the first wave of, uh, of uh, um, COVID-19 um, uh, toward the end of uh, the first quarter. Um, and overall, uh, um, the healthcare system have been able to really treat and, and uh, take care of each of the contaminated people. And um, we feel that the situation is, is quite in the, under control here. We did not have the, the, same, uh, the same issues some other countries uh, had. Um, so that's good. And in terms of other funds, beyond these uh, cultural uh, positive aspects, I believe that uh, um, each employee here is uh, very committed to the vision, to the values of other funds. Um, to the, the patient, to the, uh, to the uh, um, uh, building trust, uh, being respectful and responsible, one for the other, responsible for the health of uh, each of the, the team members, but also um, responsible for the community and um, preventing the spread of the virus, um, responsible for, um, for our relatives and, and family members, making sure that we, we keep uh, we keep everyone safe and take our responsibilities um, on the community and the uh, national wide. Yeah, I would I would divide it into you know the operations and then the business. When you had when COVID nineteen started and on the operation wise, I definitely what Didier is saying. I mean, I think we're all kind of adaptive. Also, in Israelis, I think in their characteristics and our culture, we're kind of we're, we're quick to adapt. 
Uh, and in the business side, I think this is kind of um, one of uh, prior to, um, to COVID-19, uh, our core strategy was to build a resilient food system. So once uh, COVID-19 hit, we have course, we kind of immediately gather together and understand what we need to do uh, to move forward. But actually we really noticed that we're really moving towards uh, building a sustainable and resilient food system. And that's where the world needs to go anyway. So we're really just, as long as we're moving forward and we're going towards the, the right goals, I think it's a really important matter. There's there's some different ways that you can look at um, at cultured meat or, or cellular agriculture, um, and and I maybe want to set that up a little bit for for our listeners. A lot of people on your team are doctors, or scientists, they're researchers, they're um, uh, specialists in, in this area. So just inherent in, in the research and development and in the development of, of, of the uh, um, cultured meat and, and a left, there are already measures and, and not only sustainability measures, but measures in place to uh, um, uh, follow proper protocols, avoid pathogens, uh, uh, you know, kind of how do you record and follow that research and de development process, which are almost in a place, they are in a place of sometimes social distancing in a place of, uh, you know, not chain of custody is not the right word, but uh, procedures that really should allow you to continue operations, should allow you to do many things because it, it, uh, to avoid cross contamination or any other issues while you're doing things, there's, it's got to be done in, in the right way so to, to protect the health of, of uh, not only the planet, but mainly the health of people that you're trying to, to make the meat for. Yeah, I would say that, uh, first of all, who, whom is not completely familiar with cultivated meat or cultured meat, um, I can explain briefly the, the concept. It's really to, um, to replicate a natural process occurring inside the animal for cells to multiply and build the um, muscle tissue, which is basically meat. Uh, we're, we're starting with beef, uh, so we're working with uh, cells who are isolated from a cattle, um, which have this uh, capacity to, to regenerate uh, muscle tissues. In, in nature, same as in our own bodies, the, the body of the cows uh, renews itself every few months. Cells die and are, are, are born all the time. So we, we build new tissues to replace old ones. And what we, what we know um, uh, to do is uh, to isolate those cells um, which uh, make new muscle tissue, to transfer them into um, con a controlled environment which uh, mimics the same conditions as inside the animal. So that the cells continue to behave like the world still in the animal, multiply and make muscle tissue, but under controlled conditions on the outside. So we're kind of an extension of the animal. And the uh, um, advantage of that is that we can make, in theory, an infinite amount of meat by replicating the process many times with the, the same cells without the need every time for a uh, raising and slaughtering an animal, um, which is obviously uh, uh, helps us um, being much more efficient in the way we produce the meat. We, we just need the amount of resources, water um, needed to make the steak. We don't need to uh, sustain the whole animal for two, three years until it reaches a uh, slaughter edge, and then only 40% of the animal is meat, so it's, it's very inefficient. And um, we also um, avoid animal welfare issues associated with uh, concentrated operations for animal farming. And on top of that, uh, to your question, we can uh, grow this meat and, and we grow this meat in a completely closed system with no um, possible contaminations from the outside, which also avoid the use of antibiotics. We don't need antibiotics because the system is, is closed and sterile. And so we, we um, disconnect the, um, the, the animal from the, um, from the workers, uh, making the production completely aseptic, uh, completely safe, completely controlled. Each of the steps is uh, documented and, uh, and tested. Um, and that's where we can uh, um, make meat on one hand, which is uh, safer with, without any pathogen but also make uh, the production of meat more uh, resilient. And we've seen in the US and Germany as well, um, quite a few, especially in the US, at some point in time, the production of meat went down 50% uh, 
in, uh, I think it was in May, uh, due to the, the close-up of uh, um, uh, meat processing facilities and meat, meat packing facilities, uh, which are very crowded environment for workers and uh, was uh, well, uh, really the, the, the source of uh, um, different uh, uh, pandemic uh, uh, developments and, and uh, contaminations. Uh, so the production itself is much more um, resilient. And on top of that, uh, it also enables us to, to produce meat in, in, um, locally where it is produced, um, even when we cannot uh, uh, raise and farm animals. Uh, so the, this uh, type of production we, we, we believe is, um, presents a lot of advantages, especially versus uh, industrial farming, like concentrated uh, operations of, uh, for uh, farming and uh, slaughtering animals. And we believe that uh, um, on the long term, it will um, replace a large part of those, uh, what is called factory farming practices, and will uh, evolve and coexist uh, together with more regenerative, more extensive or traditional uh, farming practices, which we see our trend today, which are uh, better in terms of um, animal welfare and uh, more respectful to the, to the environment and the, the animals, but not as um, efficient as uh, um, the um, factory farmings on one hand, which are not that good, and uh, uh, culture meat on the other hand. So we will need uh, to have a mix of uh, those different solutions to, to meet the, the goals of, uh, of the overall uh, agricultural ecosystem. Yeah, and I would add that, you know, when you look at food, when you think about food security, which is, which is, is super critical uh, worldwide, but especially now since the COVID-19, you have three elements that you're, you have to take in consideration. You want to make sure that your food is uh, available, both on a nutritional, nutritional availability, so the food is healthy, uh, that you're providing, the food is affordable, and that you have a resilient supply chain that can distribute the food properly. And we are putting, we, it is clear to us that that is focuses that we need to put a very strong emphasis on, on being, creating healthy, affordable food and building a resilient supply chain that can be able to distribute the food as well. And this is something that we've done prior to COVID-19, but it's only showing us, I mean, for us, COVID-19, and this is something that everybody's talking about is that COVID-19 is going to be like a dress rehearsal for climate events that might, that in the future might come. And we need to prepare our food systems in a more sustainable and resilient way. Uh, and these are things that we're putting our, a major focus on as well. I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up, Lee, and thank you for your nice explanation, Didier. Um, uh, I think that helps a lot of the listeners kind of understand um, what you're doing a little bit more understanding with it. I'm sure there will be more questions that arise. Um, it, it is true. It's not only production has gone down uh, worldwide, but also consumption has went down worldwide. And um, I, I'm, I'm kind of in the epicenter of, of the meat problems. There was a lot in the U.S., but... Um, in Germany, believe it or not, a, a big company called Tunis was really extremely affected and, and large scale where um, all German stores for a long time didn't have any, any meat products at all because it was so bad and, and, and how many things. The processes and the production were really not up to snuff, not only <clears throat> how they produce and process the meats, but how they protect their employees during that time. And that's a, a stark difference between how Aleph envisions the future of, of their products and, and this, you know, this, you call it cl closed, a closed system. Um, there's a similar term in, in, um, in uh, vertical farming called controlled environmental agriculture. It's a little twist in, on that same closed system, pathogen-free, very controlled environments and elements, which is really an efficient model. Um, uh, just to touch on one more thing that you mentioned in that process, DJ, and some people might know this, is uh, this has been, uh, this and last year have been really some pivotal times for Aleph 
even though the pandemic, there's been some milestones and some wonderful things reached. You guys sent some meat out into space and, and um, got a lot of news coverage from that. And some people are kind of torn. They're like, oh, well, who cares? You know, we don't want to go to space. But the thought process behind that is, the reason is, is in space, you have to use your resources efficiently. You have to use your energy efficiently. Uh, if you can do it in, in the harsh conditions of outer space, you have that built-in resiliency. So yeah, there was a lot of marketing and promotion for this, you know, going to space, but it was really a test of, of how good is that closed system? Can it function? and all different types of environments. And those are all things that can really be applied here on earth to change how we produce, to be more efficient. As you both know, um, not just the meat industry, but the whole entire food industry wastes an exorbitant amount of, of energy, food, resources, water, land, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then the waste is, turned into methane, into, into a greenhouse gas, and it, it almost turns into an exponential problem, um, or it does turn into an exponential problem for us. So I, I really like that aspect of, of the closed system, a different way, a modern way of producing that I wanted to touch upon. And then what, what Lee was saying, I'm full in agreement that we, we really are gaining so much resilience and, and future food security by changing and having global food reform all together. One other caveat I need to give my listeners is, is that I sit on the board as a sustainable advisor for a, a Left Farms, and, and that's kind of how we came together and, and meet. But this year, just a month ago, maybe maybe it's been two months ago, the World Economic Forum recognized you guys um, as a true leader and innovator and and especially around food. Can you tell us a little bit more about this uh, what this recognition that you got from the World Economic Forum and and what that means for for what you guys are doing? Yes, exactly. I think that the, the approach of other farms, and I would say that what is characterizing other farms is a combination of a few unique aspects in technology, but also an approach about uh, really leading a transition toward um, a more sustainable a global food ecosystem. Um, at other farms, we believe that the, this emerging industry has to be built right and is a, um, is a cornerstone of a uh, of this transition we're seeing uh, globally, not only for um, the resilience of the of the production, but we also see a lot of uh, food security issues, as mentioned, especially in Asia, where a lot of uh, food is imported. Um, China has imported 90% of uh, its beef, um, Japan 65%, Singapore, all of its beef. And uh, we believe that we need to build a, um, a global platform for local production. We believe that the new global will be local. And we, we've seen, um, a, a trend of a, a reduction in global trade already starting uh, two, three years ago. Global trade was uh, down at 6% in the beginning of the year following COVID-19 and restrictions on, on trade and um, transportation and exportations. So we need to make sure that we, um, we address the, the food system as a, a systemic uh, a global challenge. Uh, it's not just uh, the issue of making meat and delivering it to the market. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of thinking how we can um, transit um, and lead a just transition uh, toward a system which is uh, good for, for all the stakeholders. Um, and the collaboration with the organizations like the World Economic Forum and, and others we've been uh, actively involved with is for us a way to really make sure that we um, can connect with the, the right uh, players in the space. Um, Other farms is working as, a, as an ecosystem and not as a single company. Also, um, regarding um, collaborations we have with the large industry players, and we believe that the transition has to come from within the, the food system. Um, I personally don't believe that uh, one a startup company can completely, you know, break down and, and rebuild the whole food ecosystem by its own. Um, 
there is a lot of awareness today among the, the big food uh, companies that we need to rethink our food system and we have to work um, in coordination with them uh, to lead the transition hand in hand. Uh, so if we talk about organizations like the World Economic Forum, FAO, WWF, um, on one hand, World Economic Forum is a public-private uh, uh, platform, so it's slightly different. If we talk about uh, um, working directly with the, the leading industry players, the leading universities in the world, um, which then I believe at the center of uh, of, uh, of this, uh, this ecosystem, which is uh, by a few orders of magnitudes, magnitudes larger than other farms, and, and that's where we can drive more impact and make sure that we um, offer the, the benefits of um, cultivated meat as uh, not, not just an additional option, but and this is the solution to reach the, the, the world uh, um, uh, main organization's uh, goals uh, toward uh, achieving this uh, transition uh, right and efficiently. Would you like to add anything? Yeah, also, by the way, uh, this is a, an opportunity because next week we're being also announced by UNESCO as one of the top 10 innovations towards uh, promoting uh, the SDGs. And so something that we're putting a lot of emphasis on that we are not only promoting this new technology of cultivated meat, which is amazing, and we are one of the leaders in it, but we are going to need the way to build a sustainable food system. And sustainability is complicated. It's a sustainability and resilience that 20 years ago and 50 years ago is not even necessarily very similar to what it is today. And we constantly need to adapt towards changes that are happening on our planet. Um, if you want, I can share with you a little bit about how we're approaching our sustainability goals and what kind of how we're looking at it. I would love um, to hear that, and so would my listeners. <laughs> so we understood that in the end, we are going to build a food system of our own. So I mean, as, as we move forward, we're always being compared to the meat industry, but in the end, we're going to be an independent uh, food system of our own and we're going to have our own footprint and we, uh, we, we from the core of this company was how we take this and build a sustainable and resilient food system. So the way we look at sustainability, uh, we build it under four pillars of sustainability. Uh, the first is of course environmental. This is a, a major uh, aspect in sustainability. A lot of times it's almost, almost sometimes associated a, a almost completely only to environment, which I disagree too, but, but it is a very important aspect. Um, and we have declared that, so we call our uh, manufacturing facilities biofarms. This is how we, we call them. So our biofarms are gonna be carbon neutral by 2025. And our whole full supply chain is gonna be carbon neutral by 2030. But we're not stopping on the carbon neutrality. It's, it's a very important aspect, but we wanna also, we're building strategies regarding our water, uh, land use, uh, waste, uh, recyclability, circular production. I mean, so we have a very, uh, I would say, elaborated strategy regarding the environment. Uh, sustainable sourcing, sustainable packaging, and this all kind of fits closed loop system that's really important for us. We want to be able, and, and you spoke a little bit about our space production, uh, our space experiment, and really that you, you, you kind of explained to yourself that the, the, the concept behind the space production was that in, in the end, uh, we wanted to prove and show that cultivated meat is something that can be produced anywhere in the world, at any time in the world, and to anyone in the world. And there was no better way <laughs> to prove that than up in space in the most isolated and scarcest conditions possible. And the more we've actually moved forward with it, we've understood, even though we're very much focused on, on the earth and on the markets here, down here, but we've understood that there is a lot of, um, I would say a lot of uh, uh, goals that are very much uh, mutual in the way we approach uh, building a, a, a closed loop independent efficient uh, and sustainable food system up in space and down on Earth. So that was kind of a little bit about that concept. Uh, the second pillar of sustainability is our social uh, sustainability aspect. And, and Didier touched this a little bit about the just transition. And it's really important for us that we actually, we're not coming here to replace 
anybody. We're coming in to be an additional uh, and a diverse portfolio in the landscape of the meat industry. And actually, we're very much interested. We, we really are an extension to the agriculture, and we actually believe that the best way we can move forward is in collaboration with the, the meat industry, with the livestock farmers, with agriculture in general. So we're putting, and, and just in general, also strengthening uh, the local communities. That's a really important aspect for us as well. Our third uh, pillar is, and this is already where we spoke a little bit about the food security, but the third pillar is uh, nutrition and health and sustainable diets. So we're putting a really strong emphasis on that as well, that we're really uh, providing accessible nutrition and nutritional food. And of course, the last pillar is the economic aspects of the sustainability. And that's where we make sure also in a food security aspect uh, regarding affordable food and with the resilient supply chain uh, and that our business, and this is something that's really important that our sustainability is a driver for, for the growth of our business. So we, I mean, in the end, to be sustainable, you have to have all of these aspects and then we do want to grow and we believe that this is the right way to grow. So um, these are kind of the ways we're approaching it. And of course, all of this is being done together with building these partnerships and building an ecosystem around it and working together with some amazing uh, uh, strategic partners, partners and brands that are all very much with, you know, in, in a mutual goal towards a, towards a better a better future, I would say. I would agree as well. So congratulations on the UNESCO. That That's a fabulous thing to hear. And um, you, you guys know, and my listeners know that I'm an advocate for the sustainable development goals. And I work on many projects with the United Nations and all 17 of the sustainable development goals are tied to food, 11 of them intrinsically tied to food. And uh, we've had many discussions on, on how, how they integrate in those pillars and that transition. So I really like to hear that, that that's continuing and that we, we were originally supposed to see each other and get a tour of the facility in the lab um, in July, but because of the pandemic that has obviously change things but the the progress and the roadmap really is kept continued to go as i mentioned the world economic forum recognition now the unesco some other wonderful partnerships and things that have occurred during that time we're still able to see each other uh, virtually and, and uh, progress on on the the roadmap and this transition um I, what i'm hearing overall and we're we're almost halfway into the show and we haven't really asked a, a lot of the major questions. And it's really that uh, you had that resilient preparedness with the business model, the way your operations were and the way you were thinking of producing and conducting business with all facets involved that has actually proven to be a fabulous model, business model to get you through hard times through pandemics, through Black Lives Matters and Beirut uh, uh, explosion and, and, and whatever else to come. And I believe strongly that you will also have that resilience going forward in production. Uh, Didier has heard me say this before and probably some of my listeners before. It's not the brand or the product of the future that is the, the most important. It's really how we produce in the future that's the most important. If you look back at the way we conduct schools from the 1930s to today, there's not much that has changed. And, and with the agriculture, food and beverage industry, it's almost the same. We've got a little mechanization, some automation, but there's only been about six innovations and there's really the productions and the processes have not changed that drastically, but yet the waste and, and the impact on health and other things has been dramatic. And so it is time for a global food reform. It is time to change how we produce. And, and um, I don't know if the listeners hear it out, but I definitely hear it as you want to produce in a, in a clean tech way, in a closed environment, without waste, efficiency of resources, uh, without harm on environment and planet and human health. And that is really um, a, a successful um, menu 
for a successful product because it's virtually impossible to produce a product that is done under those great conditions with innovation, with those tools that uh, uses renewable energy and uses resources efficiently than to have a product that tastes like crap or is no good or, or bad on human health and, and the environment. Those two don't go together. That's, that's a different path. Um, and so I, I really like to hear and say that. I, I just kind of wanted to, to mirror that back here. Didier, you took some notes, so I think you might have something you want to tell me before I get to my next question. Yes, yeah, sure. I, um, I think um, if we talk about the, the business model for, for Elephants and the, um, the platform we've been building uh, since we started the company's operations uh, three, three, four years ago, um, it's, uh, this platform is exactly suited for the post-COVID times. And I think, you know, on one hand, we believe that the, the current crisis is accelerating the food trends which were already ongoing before the COVID-19. Uh, for a um, more uh, environmental friendly and uh, uh, transition toward carbon neutrality uh, production. We see in Europe, for instance, uh, the European uh, Commission published the, the Green Deal uh, plans uh, at the end of 2019, before COVID-19, but they, they actually accelerated the, the transition and decided to invest more resources to upgrade the European infrastructure with the, uh, the Just Transition Fund and uh, part of the recovery plan of Europe is uh, uh, allocated also to agriculture and uh, building back a better food ecosystem while supporting the, the transition to one ca toward carbon neutrality, the farm to fork, the biodiversity strategy. All those plans have been accelerated following COVID-19 and are completely in line with the, uh, the philosophy and the, the vision of other farms. We see also um, other um, trends we've uh, talked about for more food security, for instance, in uh, Singapore has uh, this 30 by 30 plan to produce more food locally. China has been acquiring um, livestock farms in Southeast Asia and, and Australia for the last uh, three, four, five years to ensure uh, access to, to meat and uh, food security. And this, those plans have been uh, accelerated now with uh, COVID-19. And a lot of uh, trends have been accelerated. On the other hand, um, we do see that there, there have been also some changes. And, and what you mentioned about resilience, I think, especially as we talk about the meat industry, has been striking. 70% of the meat uh, produced in the world today is produced in uh, uh, the same factory, farmings, uh, factory farming facilities we discussed earlier, meaning intensive concentrated operations. Um, and, and those large meat companies have been focused on efficiency, efficiency, and efficiency for the last decades. Um, gaining another 1% of efficiency in the, the, the way you, you grow the animals, the way you slaughter, the, if you've been in a slaughterhouse, it's really a super efficient uh, factory where animals has, are slaughtered at, at the speed of light. And it, it's really, you know, on one hand, striking how we lose the connection with the animal. And, and uh, uh, how does this whole supply chain has been focused only on uh, producing more protein more efficiently. And following COVID-19 and the disruptions in the supply, um, in the production, in the, uh, in the trade, we see a big shift uh, from efficiency toward resilience. And big uh, meat companies are today really thinking about uh, that diversifying their, uh, the source for the, for the meat um, uh, changing the, the practices to ensure resiliency and uh, to ensure resilience in terms of uh, uh, incorporating more um, digitalization, automation, flexibility in the supply chain. Um, and we're exactly there, meaning the uh, cultural meat is produced um, in a fully digitalized and automated way. And uh, we have a full flexibility, very short uh, reaction time. It takes uh, uh, two, three years. To, to take a, a bill to slaughter it and, and to, to get the meat. So you cannot really plan in advance anything. Uh, I mean, you have to plan three years in advance. You cannot adapt uh, with a short uh, uh, notice uh, to, to changes in the market. Um, if the, the supply chain is 100% efficient, uh, but 0% flexible. Um, in our case, we're both. Uh, we're 100% more efficient than the current supply chain and production system but we're also uh, completely flexible. Uh, it takes three weeks to, to make the meat. We can adjust supply and demand. 
Uh, we can, uh, as I said, produce the meat locally, uh, empower the, the communities, the, the consumers today want to know where the food comes from. Um, they, they want a local food production, they want to, to trace the food uh, back to the source. Um, Cotton meat is 100% transparent, 100% traceable. Uh, we can uh, provide the full story of the steak uh, to the consumer back to the single cell used to produce it. Um, and our goal would be to, to, to produce the meat, to cultivate it locally where it's, uh, where it's consumed. Uh, so I think that overall, um, uh, we do see the, this, uh, this transition of uh, uh, the global food ecosystem, which is completely in line with, uh, with the, uh, the strategy of other farms and our philosophy from day one. And that's why there's more and more interest in, in uh, cultivated meat. If a couple of years ago, um, the type of, this type of, of research, and again, that there is no product cleared in, in the market yet, and all the companies in other farms is considered probably one of the you know, three, four leading companies in, in this emerging industry. All the products are still either at the development phase or, or toward transfer to production. That's where we stand uh, here at other farms. Uh, but we see today that the, the European Union is taking cultivated meat uh, uh, in account in rebuilding the economy. And we're talking at a high level with the, uh, different ministries in Singapore, in uh, Japan. We're now studying a national, national plan for uh, economic recovery and food um, security in Israel, our home country. And uh, talking with uh, um, different, some of the largest meat companies in the world to incorporate this new type of production within the existing uh, supply chain. And uh, so there's an acceleration of uh, uh, the awareness and the, the interest in uh, cultivated meat as an additional um, uh, production method, which would uh, uh, integrate and provide advantages to the, the current meat supply chain. Yeah, I would, I would add that, you know, the current food system is very focused, I don't know, also being efficient, but in a very profitable way. Right. The focus is only about the revenue. And there hasn't been enough focus on external costs of the, uh, of the food system. And external costs, and this is a problem that also is, by the way, also because the government and the, and, and the regulation it doesn't exactly know how to um, uh, convert these external costs to an actual uh, a price tag. And I think that's happening now with COVID-19. I think it's been trying, there's been like, this is part of that transition because in the end, it's something that we're constantly saying is that when you build a sustainable and a long-term uh, vision towards a food system and a supply chain, then it is actually more profitable than taking in consideration just the amount of money uh, and revenue you can have this year or next year. Um, and also not taking enough uh, in consideration the, the insecurities of, you know, where the market is going, what kind of pandemics and climate events can happen the, in the future. The true cost, the total environmental cost, um, uh, not only as percentage of EBITDA, but how that all those externalities are actually included in there because <clears throat> that is something that's, um, a lot of companies who talk about resilience or sustainability, they, um, uh, you know, they also say uh, we're going to reduce our carbon emissions by 70% by this date, and we're going to go neutral by this date, which is, which is fine. But all the things that they've been doing or emitting since they've been in business, all those external costs, the to true costs, the total value since they've been in business, they're not talking about that, like remo removing their historical carbon emissions or, or making sure that since they've been in business, whatever they polluted or affect uh, by not talking about total environmental cost or the true cost, that they're going to take care of that. And those are, those are not only emissions and pollutions and impacts on our planet, that someone has to rebalance or account for that we have to fix just by if the entire world were to stop and say yeah we're going to do it good by this time there's things in the past that that we have to kind of make right or or get back into the safe operating space of our planetary boundaries so this really transitions nicely to the to the first question and that is 
Um, you guys operate internationally. You, you, you're working with all different types of companies. You're from Israel. I'm, I'm in Germany. I'm from America. But I get uh, asparagus and potatoes from Israel all the time. Um, the, they're the innovators and, and food experts on how to grow in extreme harsh conditions. And they're not even in outer space because they know how to do it efficiently, properly, and, uh, uh, and do it very well. My question is, do you guys feel personally or as a company like you're global citizens? And what would a future uh, feel like for you um, without borders, nations, divisions of humanity? Because during this pandemic, the one thing that wasn't on lockdown, that wasn't stopped, uh, among a couple other things besides the virus, was food. Food was transcended all borders, divisions, nations, and it kept moving, uh, not as efficiently. We had a lot of food security and other issues, but it's one that when the humans stopped moving, that was also still moving around our world. What are your thoughts and ideas or feelings about that? You can both answer. I believe that the, um, it's, a, it's a very good question. And we, we do believe that, uh, and that's again an acceleration of a trend we've seen occurring in the last few years. Uh, many consumers are looking for better quality food uh, than they were before COVID-19 and are more aware about the, you know, the nutritional value for them, the well-being and the, um, the health aspects of food, uh, uh, more cooking at home, more interested in the uh, in the quality of the raw materials of the food that they eat um, during this uh, pandemic. Um, and that's, a, that's actually a trend we've seen toward organic uh, uh, you know, production, for instance, in, in the US and Europe, uh, toward uh, locally produced from farm to fork. That, that's a, I would say that connects to a pre-existing trend, but which has been in our views accelerated as other trends by, uh, by COVID-19. And that's uh, one of the, um, you know, one of the, the challenges that Aleph found is really to, on one hand, um, connect and provide good solutions to, this, uh, uh, to those uh, you know, local production requirements, uh, um, uh, resilience, sustainability, sustainability uh, transition toward carbon neutrality, which are even more critical now than they were uh, last year. On the other hand, we have also to take into account those, uh, um, uh, those wishes and those uh, um, aspirations of the consumers for more uh, sticking to, to natural and to, uh, to local uh, food they understand and they know. Um, obviously, the cultivation method for meat is a new method. It's a, um, you know, parallel to, let's say, hydroponic uh, uh, cultivation of uh, fruit and vegetable, same as uh, a lettuce, which is produced in uh, urban farming uh, or uh, vertical uh, farming uh, framework is, uh, is uh, produced with the same seed and ends up with the same end product but is grown and disconnected from the soil under a controlled environment, as you mentioned uh, before, uh, with exactly the amount of water and nutrient needed in a clean environment without pesticide. We do the same, we implement the same approach to meat. Um, and that, that's uh, definitely, um, it, it requires some, uh, some education. At Aleph Farms, we we're really working very closely with the consumers to make sure that we also uh, fit into uh, um, this uh, trend I mentioned. Um, we're working with the non-genetically modified cells and with uh, the meat, which is a uh, non-GMO, uh, which is very important for, uh, for many of the, um, the, the segments we're talking about. And we stick as much as possible to the natural process and replicating the, the experience of meat, not just making protein and we believe meat especially within food, is not just a functional product. Food as a whole is a very uh, social, emotional, um, historical uh, um, uh, product. It, it's not just uh, intended to fuel the body. There are a lot of uh, other uh, connections to, to food and, and meat, especially meat is uh, uh, the center of the plate. That's how we call meat in, uh, in the catering and food, uh, uh, food service industry. So we want to make sure that we connect to the um, to the tradition of meat, we're talking about contemporary tradition, meaning um, updating uh, an existing tradition and not changing it or not uh, disrupting tradition. 
reconnecting to the communities and making sure that we can cultivate meat at start with the attributes of the meat growing inside the animal in terms of nutritional quality, culinary quality, sensory quality, without the need for additives or, or modifications. Uh, so the, one of the challenges of elephants is to, to combine uh, new technologies which are needed today to, to drive the world toward a thriving future. We cannot continue managing our, our food system uh, as of today uh, um, and uh, um, leave uh, a legacy worth living to the next generations. And so we have to incorporate technology in the food system. On the other hand, we want to make sure we don't um, we don't uh, disconnect with the consumers because of the technology input in, in, a, in a product which is that sensitive and emotional. Uh, and that, that's fascinating. I mean, I've always been uh, fascinated by, the, by food because it's, uh, it actually um, combines, you know, so many... Culture, history, <laughs> emotions, exactly. experiences, yeah. Uh, so, so many aspects uh, and uh, it's loaded with uh, so many uh, different uh, uh, psychological and, and, uh, and social uh, um, aspects um, and we're taking that into account very, very uh, um, seriously. For instance, we've been the first company in this emerging space of cultivated meat to open a visitor center, uh, which is today, you know, not active because of COVID-19, but the idea is uh, really to open, an, you know, a genuine and a candid dialogue with the, uh, you know, the larger audience here the the concerns, uh, exchange ideas, answer the questions, share facts. And there are very little facts on culture meat today, a lot of opinions, but <laughs> zero facts. I mean, or very little facts. And we, we need to build trust um, in this new industry and uh, we're doing our best to make sure that as one of the leaders in this, uh, in this uh, space, we, we have a responsibility for building this industry right. And, and we're uh, doing our best to do so. Yeah, I would say also, I mean, technology and innovation is, is, is critical uh, moving forward, but education is, 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 not, is, is not any less than that. And it's not only education on, on, on cultivated meat, which is very important for us to teach, you know, the consumers of potential new products, but it's, uh, we, and we can see this, the trends of the new generations are interested in, in responsible consumption, in really understanding where they're buying their food, why they're buying it, People, what, what is healthy? What's the definition of healthy food? Is sustainable diet, is it all about the environment or is it about also being healthy with your, in, with your body? And these are things that the more we investigate it, the more we see that there's still a lot of, of progress that needs to happen towards a, a consuming food. I mean, it's just in general, in, in consumption, but uh, so education is like, is super critical for us. Uh, also in looking at it just in general, I mean, how much, how much food should you consume? I mean, we have some areas in the world where everybody's been in overconsumption while other areas in the world, uh, actually the most, uh, one of the things that I, I read uh, due to COVID-19 is that, um, first of all, uh, unfortunately, the amount of hungry people worldwide is going to increase uh, tremendously by the end of 2020, but also that the, uh, the food that's the most accessible to these hungry people is actually ultra-processed food, which is extremely unhealthy and it maintains their malnutrition. So also understanding, I mean, so of course it's, it's complex and different ge geographies have different um, uh, situations that we need to, you need to take in consideration, but, but I think that's a really critical thing. And when you talk about borders, uh, so I'm not gonna get into political or geopolitical issues, at all, but we have now social network and we have a digitalized world where you can literally in at any place that you live, uh, pretty much you can reach out to people worldwide. Um, and I think that's something that we need, we're taking in consideration. So like understanding that now this is beyond uh, the geopolitical uh, border, but we're talking about, we have this open towards uh, towards consumers worldwide. People are interested worldwide in what we're doing. We have people pr promote, uh, uh, approaching us through the visitor center, from Africa, from the South America, from Asia, I mean, literally everywhere that, and, and it's easy, it's, it's accessible, it's approachable. So maybe not physically they can visit us, but we, they can talk with us. We also have a really interesting program called the Gen Z uh, Board. 
And it kind of sits on a little bit about what uh, Didier was talking about, about thinking about our future generations. So we have a, a program where every year we have a Gen Z advisory board. Uh, we bring in about, I think, the, around 10, 10, uh, 10 members that all uh, from generations at Z. And so they're pretty much, pretty much from the age of 16 to 22, 24. And it's kind of uh, this mutual relationship where we're also educating and helping. They're very interested in what's going on in out of fires. And we're also getting a lot of their perspective and how they look at the future and what they want to see from food systems themselves. And we're both, the, it's, it's extremely beneficial, I think, for both sides, so. Thank you for being so politically correct, but you, you did answer the question. And, and um, I, I do feel that, you know, it's it's complex because it can get it can get uh, geopolitical. It can it can be that way. Um, that's that's the world we live in. There's decisions that, uh, for example, Bolsonaro in, in, in Brazil uh, has made uh, that affect us all around the world. You know, and those are not only uh, political decisions; they're food and resource decisions that affect our entire planet. And so this um, food as, as a, a global voice and um, an improvement from what we've had over the last, since the industrial age and even before that is so vital that we get it right because it's also, um, it's the biggest impact of human health and, and environment, but it's also the biggest lever that we can use to, to make things right and to draw down and to correct um, mistakes to get us back into not only true cost and total environmental cost, but into the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries to sustain ourselves for, for multiple generations, not only with resources, but with the wherewithal and uh, resources to, to keep our companies and, and humanity flowing further. My first uh, really hard question for you guys is the burning question. It's WTF, and it's not the swear word. Um, it's what's the future? I think that uh, it's, a <laughs> it's a good question. I'm optimistic about the future. I think that uh, you know the, what happened in the last uh, six months is uh, for us um, an alert. I think it helps us, uh, you know, uh, stop, uh, rethink, uh, reset a lot of uh, practices. And I believe with you know together with the, all the sorrow, of, you know the the collaterals and I mean the, the impact and the, and the victims of these pandemics, which is obviously um, a very uh, a sad, uh, sad event. Um, on the mid to long term, I believe that it will, uh, it's, also, it, it, it's helping and um, pinpointing the, the weaknesses of the, the way we build our globalization. And I agree with you that, uh, you know, the global world, uh, is the way to, to manage uh, our resources and our communities. On the other hand, we have to build it right. And we have to take care of the, the resources, getting back uh, to balance with nature. We have to make sure that we empower the communities and that we um, share the, the resources and the, the wealth um, in a better way. Um, and, and overall, um, the one is for the need to change the way we manage our, our, our world uh, is increasing, um, not only by um, the um, you know the people like you and me, but also uh, by governments. We do see that you know there have been a lot of nice goals in the last you know 20 years, but very little real actions, incentives, political acts. I think this is changing. And many companies are also accelerating their, uh, their goals toward uh, more carbon neutrality. And there's, uh, there will be an acceleration of uh, a change in the good, uh, uh, good direction. Um, at the end of the day, the, my main driver for Alphans is uh, primarily to, to build a better legacy for, for my, my children and the children of, uh, of my peers. Um, and uh, I believe that uh, um, 
the, this vision is, a, is gaining much more clarity um, in those times and is also uh, gaining more adherence by um, the different uh, communities throughout the world. So overall, I'm, I'm optimistic. And I think we're heading toward a better world where technology will be used uh, for um, positive and good purposes to really um, push human progress forward. And I believe we'll have a better repartition of the wealth. We'll have, um, we'll find the right uh, balance between uh, global platforms and local productions and empowering local communities. And, and I, I do see that uh, we will revert climate change. We will find um, better ways uh, to manage our, our uh, natural resources. And so I'm, a, I'm a optimistic. A healthier world uh, in balance with nature and uh, people with uh, um, a more connection to their communities and, and uh, more control over their lives. Well, I'm also optimistic, but maybe I, I look at it in a different uh, perspective. I think we're in a critical decade and uh, in general changes uh, happen slowly, especially in this ma uh, magnitude. I mean, you can, I mean, even looking at women's rights, even looking at these massive changes that are worldwide, these don't happen, they don't happen in short times. I mean, they, they don't happen in one generation. These are, they, they happen slowly. And that's okay. As long as we're moving forward, that's okay. But we are in a very critical decade where we need all players uh, within, uh, within our ecosystem, governments, institutions, a young technology companies, a manufacturers, consumers all need to kind of work together towards making that change. And that's a bit, so I think in that aspect, I think the COVID-19 was actually has a positive outcome because it gave, I think everybody an opportunity to really understand how scary it can be in, in the longer term. And I think people needed to feel that a little bit. And I, I hope, and, and, every, and, and if there is, if there, the, the, the word out there is to build back better, and we are definitely part of that movement. Uh, and we hope, uh, and, we, and that's where we're going to continue. I mean, for me personally, as long as I'm focused uh, on a personal level, on a professional level, of looking at what I can leave here, what I can do for my children, for the next generations, I think we're, we're moving uh, towards we're moving to a better place, but I do think this is not a place where you can stay, uh, you know, on a low profile. I think everybody needs to kind of get it, move forward. And I think a lot of it has to do also with education because I think a lot of still, a lot of people are still not really clear about what is exactly happening. And what's, and, and when people don't understand what's happening, they tend to kind of freeze. I just kind of say, never mind. Uh, and I and I, I'm a big believer that we need to be part of helping everybody, kind of engaging everybody. In, and it starts with good education. It starts with good regulation, uh, and then of course uh, building resilient operations. So, yeah, uh, I think I'm positive, but I'm also very, I'm very uh, clear about that we need to act and we need to act fast. Yeah, I, I agree with you, and I thank you for both of your your views. And, and um, what happens is not a lot of us get this deer in the headlights, you know, type of we kind of freeze. We don't know what to do. Uh, the other thing is there's this uh, fight or flight with with uh, humanity that if we see a tiger, a lion, you know, a bear, then we tr we kind of react with this fight or flight. But if we see a graph or a chart or climate change, which sometimes is not always, you know, immediately um, as uh, pronounced as a tiger, lion, or bear, <clears throat> that we say, oh, there's another graph, another chart, or oh yes, there in in India or in uh, Brazil, something's burning or something's going on, uh, and so the reaction. Is a little bit different. We don't know how to process this big, unfathomable thing. That we we've mentioned the word resilience quite a bit today, um, and I want to I want to break that down a little bit. Sustainability is not only the buzzword, but it's been around for a while, and it's something that we need to do and achieve and, and work towards. 
the reason we're using this resilience is because it does absolutely does not matter how sustainable a country, a city, a community, a company is. Um, when tomorrow a hurricane hits you, um, a, a pandemic or, or uh, those things, usually those type of natural catastrophes or events, especially climate change, are enough to wipe out even the most sustainable organizations within one day. So uh, those sustainable companies that were just hit by the hurricane in uh, Louisiana, they're gone. It's going to take them probably four to five years to to build back up to to get their operations, to get their their agriculture and everything back up in alignment. Back in Puerto Rico a few years ago, uh, Hurricane Maria hit. Uh, those the, there was hardly any sustainable uh, organization or infrastructure there. But that is something that does not get built back up in the next day. And so. When we talk about resilience, it's about uh, resilience is, is really neat because it has sustainability ingrained within it. And if you have a, res a resilient business model, when the pandemics, when the natural catastrophes, when those things, those environmental issues and other issues occur, you can weather those storms w uh, fa fairly resiliently to still deliver essentials to still um, function and, and recoil back from that global view to that local view and say, okay, we've just went through this. Now we're gonna make sure the people in Israel or in Germany or wherever are fed and given their, what they need, the resources and those things. So it puts you in a real unique spot. As a company, as a startup, uh, you guys have been involved in other companies, big and small. Um, sustainability and resilience has really always been a, a really hard sell over the years you know is it cost effective do we have the budget for it can we do it why should we is it going to return a profit you know uh, whatever the the holdback was over the years during this pandemic one thing that we've learned and one thing that's we we can pull out of it um, that really has has completely changed not only that the world can unify and turn on a dime to, to change the power of humanity, the gravitational pull of humanity to change on a dime and, and go in the right direction and fix things that, that, that we were able to do things during this pandemic. But um, this resilience is really not called sustainability anymore. It's called environmental social governance, ESG. And... Um, for those businesses that began early years ago and even um, as late as last year, 2019, the last quarter of last year, to divest and invest in environmental social governance business models and, and, and investments and funds um, really have, have shown a strong proof. And I, and I kind of just wanna, wanna tell you about a few of those examples that for those who are listening, those startups and those people who are thinking, what's the best model to use and what, what way to go, that there's some proof that we have in the first and second quarter uh, indexes of this year, that <clears throat> for every, um, company that invested or divested in environmental social governance index stocks or funds if you just look towards the new york stock exchange the nasdaq the s p 500 the s p global the stocks europe 600 benchmark the collier the capital the nikki index goldman sachs and hbsc and i could go on and on research reports during the first and second quarters of 2020 in the middle, in the depths, in the thralls of a pandemic and an economic, global economic, severe issues, layoffs and, and on and on, all of those research reports during those quarters show that sustainable index funds lost less than their conventional counterparts and in index funds. Seven out, of ten, seven out of 10 sustainable equity funds finished in the top halves of their morning star categories. That is 25 out of 26 environmental, social, and governance tilted 
funds outperform their closest conventional counterparts. Publicly traded companies who take sustainability and environmental social governance seriously seem to always outperform their conventional counterparts across various markets and various geographies. Fossil fuels are stranded assets, global, uh, Goldman Sachs has said, and the only other commodity looking as precarious as oil and fossil fuels is livestock. ESG risk factors leave companies exposed to global shocks. And what we mentioned today, Tunis and Germany and those meat companies in the US, those business models have actually come back to bite them very hard. Um, I don't say they need to go away, but it's time to get up to speed with our exponentially growing world and build that resilience into our model so that when times like this come, we have a better model that brings us out on the other side, much better, much more secure, not only for our children and grandchildren, but just that's the, that's the better model. That's the way we need to do it. You, you wouldn't go to, to Elon Musk or Tesla uh, uh, and say, hey, you guys just produce that new cool cyber truck. I want you to throw 40% of those away immediately. They'd, they'd say, hey, that's a bad business model. Why would we do that? You go to the oil, coal, and gas industry, you, say, you just pulled all that, that, that great uh, uh, fuels out of the ground and, and oil and coal. Now throw 40% away and then we can start. That's what we've been doing in, the, in our industry, the food, agriculture, seafood, food and beverage industry for years. And it's just a bad, inefficient model. It's not working for human health and our environment. The proof's in the pudding. And so I, I know you guys are aware of this, um, but I, I wanted to make sure our listeners knew that, that you spread that message to those that you speak with. And I have three, or actually, yeah, three last questions for you that are so vital. And they're really more or less a sustainable takeaway that I want for my listeners. If there was one message that you could depart to our listeners, uh, a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, um, if they're in your same situation as an innovator or a startup, um, what would you say is something that they should think about to make a real impact on our world? Um, Just an easy question, isn't it? Uh, such an easy one. No, and I'll tell you what I think. I think sustainability, there's a lot of misconceptions when it comes to sustainability. I think people that live uh, sustainability, like uh, us and you, and you Mark, uh, really understand that sustainability is holistic and it has a lot of balance in between it and it contains many pillars. But for many people, they look at sustainability and they kind of think it's a nice to have thing. It's more about donating back. It's not about a business plan and growth. Uh, and it's a lot about very much focused on, almost only on environment. Uh, and I think maybe that is something that I would kind of say that you need to look at sustainability as a driver for your business to grow and to be profitable, and that it is, needs to be balanced uh, between, and there's gonna be trade-offs. Like everything in the world, you're gonna need to decide what, you, what you're promoting and what you're gonna have to pay for it, but you do need to look at it in a more holistic approach. Uh, so I do think that that is something, and I really do believe that looking forward, and, and you kind of just proved it, with your uh, data all about uh, the successful companies in the last uh, two uh, quarters, but sustainability is actually uh, the right way to grow your business on a long term. A lot of times young companies can only, and, and, and I understand why, can only think about the short term, uh, but there always needs to be in the back of their head looking in the longer vision, how we build it, how we stay uh, towards uh, it being existing in this pretty much in the same mythology also in 50 years and 100 years and 200 years and you know as someone who's worked with many multinational companies in the past a few years this is what their this is their main challenge they have infrastructure of 100 years that may, that has been built from from the from the inception 
in a linear model that uh, causes a lot of waste and a lot of inefficiencies. And now they understand that they need to make these changes and these changes are gonna cost them a lot of resources and it's gonna take a lot of time. So actually for a younger innovator that's building their company, I think these are things that need to be taken in consideration relatively early time. And I think that's an important aspect. Yeah, we said that, um... I would suggest that the key issues to be tackled today should be meat is obviously one of the key polluters of the, of the world and one of the most uh, resource intensive way to produce food, especially beef. And in terms of the use of uh, land, water, greenhouse gas emissions, plus ethics and animal welfare issues, I do believe that meat is really one uh, big issue to be tackled. Beyond that, uh, I agree with you that uh, the West issue in the food system is a, is a very important issue to be addressed. And I think there are a lot of ways to improve that. And some companies and startups are, are working on those issues. I also believe that the, the, the water issue should be, um, should be, uh, should deserve uh, more attention. Um, and on the, the food um, and health, it's a combination of food and health. I believe that the sugar reduction is a very, very big, uh, an important objective for the for the food industry. If um, you could have the chance to experience or learn something in your professional journey, uh, what would you have loved to know from the start when you began? Whether it was your other companies or even a left, what? What would you say, man? I wish I would have known from the start. And could you impart that to that uh, uh, Gen Z and, and um, the the startups or those people who are knowing what what could you give them as advice? Boy, I wish I would have known this from the start. It would have saved me a lot of heartache and trouble and a learning curve. My side, I would say, uh, be humble. When you when you're humble, you listen and you're receptive, and so you make less mistakes. You also make sure that you um, you connect other players um, to your to your vision, and you build it together with them instead of imposing things. As innovators, many times we think that we have a great solution and that we will change the world and that we will you know, make a big impact and that at the end of the day, it doesn't work like that. Um, someone who is arrogant, does not listen, um, does not understand the, the real uh, needs of the, of the ecosystem, of the industry, and uh, will not succeed of, of the consumers and customers uh, when we're developing a product. So I think being humble is, um, is uh, probably the, the key to, to succeed in, um, in the um, innovation world and we, we've seen a lot of uh, examples of uh, uh, demonstrating that. I would say I have this expression I always say to my kids and that you don't need to be, don't be right, be smart. So I mean sometimes even if you know there is a way that you see but you need to engage people to work with you and you need to work around with people that still have uh, different perspectives and their perspectives are something you need to honor and understand and find a way to work together with. And I think that's a really important part. Sometimes people are putting too much emphasis on being, the, 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 you know, knowing more and knowing better, but not necessarily knowing how to engage and work together. And we all need to work together to promote these goals of climate change and, and pandemics and, 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 and resilient food systems. So that is something I would also kind of, took me a while also to establish this, but, but it's definitely something that I think is very important. The last question I have is really your advice for those in your same field as cultivated meat, um, what, um, two or three actions can uh, citizens and decision makers take to, to accelerate or impact your field to help you guys um, 
consumption habits, what, you know, whatever it is, what, what is something that the consumer out there um, could help you with or that you're looking for um, or some kind of action that they could take to, to help you guys as a company in that transition? Yeah. Uh, we're, we're in the quite uh, intimate interaction with, uh, with a larger audience all the time and with potential consumers and I believe that what's important is uh, to ask the right questions um, on their side and for us to provide uh, good answers and to be open, transparent, to build trust. I think it's important that, you know, especially when we talk about uh, uh, new, new technologies, um, that we don't, uh, uh, you know, take positions based on opinions, uh, rather on uh, on uh, on facts. And again, t today we get a lot of support for many people all around the world, and there is a lot of uh, interest in uh, in cultivated meat uh, from you know all the different uh, social demographic uh, layers in different countries of the world. But still, I think that the um, we want to make sure that, that new technologies are um, assessed by each of the consumers with the, you know, while they, they, are, they have access to, to accurate information and that they might decide to purchase or not to purchase cultured meat, that's perfect, perfectly fine. <laughs> I'm not trying to dictate anything or to force people. But I think it, even when you, you want to buy it or you don't want to buy it, I think it's important and it's also part of our responsibility to make sure that that we open and, um, a genuine and a, a candid dialogue. And uh, we ask the, 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 you know, the potential consumers and the, the younger generation, the older generations, uh, people interested in the space uh, to, really, to really learn it, to understand what the, the benefits are, what the limitations are, and to ensure that we have um, a sincere, uh, open and transparent dialogue. We. Oui. You know, the, uh, they say that survivors are not the strongest, right? They're the, the ones that know how to adapt. And I think that's something that we're constantly also looking at and understanding. It's, we, we see that there's, it's a dynamic evolution. Uh, cultivated meat in general is still not in the market. There's still a lot of people that are learning the concept. And we're, and one of the reasons why we have this Gen Z uh, program is really just so we can constantly be in that communication with the consumers and understanding where, where, where we need to always kind of, you know, refine and adapt. We have a very clear vision, but we also want to be always in that, uh, uh, I guess, the engagement um, and dialogue with, with our consumers. That's all I have, unless you guys want to ask me any questions or if you have any final words that you would like to say. I really appreciate you guys being here. Um, do you have anything that you'd like to add or ask me before we say goodbye? I'm just going to say thank you. Thank you for having us. It's been an honor, and we really appreciate it. We always love working with you, and it's great to, to have this kind of podcast together. It was a great conversation. Thanks a lot, Mark. And uh, in case uh, any of the auditors have any further questions, we'd be glad, you know, if they would just reach out to us to our website or, or directly. We'll put the link to the website on the podcast show notes and, uh, and all the social media postings. So they will definitely see and hear about it and uh, they can reach out to you and see how they can get involved and support and help and follow your wonderful, great progress. As well, I'll keep them up to date. Uh, I've, I've talked to you about you guys on other podcasts because I think you guys are fabulous and I love what you do and I hope that uh, we see each other very soon. Thanks so much, you guys. Have a great day, rest of the week. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.